All right, this evening I've already told you that we are coming back to Second uh, Chronicles, and this evening I just simply want to read the one verse that we're going to be uh, looking at, although I will make reference to a couple of other verses as I'm working my way uh, towards that verse. But let me just read verse uh, 9 of Second Chronicles 16. This is what Hanani the prophet said to Asa when he failed to put his trust in the Lord. He says, For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. And, and those are the words we want to focus on uh, this evening. Now let me just remind you what we looked at this morning. We, we did see that um, uh, Baasha set up a blockade essentially to, and that was in Ramah, to stop the immigration from Israel to the southern kingdom because the Lord had given his blessing to Judah. He had revived Asa's heart. Uh, Asa had cleansed the land and cleansed the worship of the Lord. The Lord was blessing and the faithful in Israel wanted to join with them. Uh, so Baasha, uh, Baasha tried to stop that, but we saw Asa's response in this particular case is over against maybe what he had done in the past. How instead of trusting in the Lord, he bribed Ben-Hadad, who is the Syrian king that Baasha has essentially allied himself with, uh, to break his treaty with Baasha and attack him instead. And we also saw how, at least temporarily, this seemed to solve the problem that he was faced with. Baasha withdrew. He was no longer a problem for King Asa. Uh, actually, as we look at the history of Israel, we see that he died just shortly after that. I think it was only a matter of a few months. And we saw how Asa was able to take the materials that he was using to fortify Ramah and uh, build basically a, another blockade or another, uh, other military stations in order to fortify those cities against any future attacks uh, by Israel. So everything seemed to be going fine at least until the prophet came to him with this message, what, what this was actually going to cost him. Uh, he said that his victory, the victory that he thought that he had over Baasha, could have been much greater than it was. He says in Second Chronicles 16, verse 7, because you have relied on the king of Aram and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Aram has escaped out of your hand. Um, essentially, he could have defeated Ben-Hadad and would have had then the future issues that he was going to have with them. They were going to be a thorn in their side from that point forward. Uh, he should, what he should have done is what he did earlier when he was faced with a much larger threat. He trusted in the Lord. Verse 8, were not the Ethiopians and the Lubim, an immense army, remember a million men, with very many chariots and horsemen. Yet, because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. If you had relied on him this time, he would have done the same. And then the point, the Lord is looking for those who trust him, that he might help them. I mean, the Lord wants to help his people who trust him. And here's where we come to our verse. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Now, what we want to do this evening is probe this last verse a bit more deeply and try to understand its meaning and what it is that essentially the Lord wants to see in us and what the results uh, will be. Now, first of all, what is the prophet saying when he tells us that the Lord's eyes are moving to and fro throughout the earth. Well, we, we do know biblically that God knows everything and he doesn't have to look to see or to learn. He knows. But the prophet is telling us that the Lord at least is representing himself to us as one who is searching, that he is looking, that he sees. And he is looking carefully for something that is very precious to him. Now, backing up just a minute, again, we know that the Lord sees everything. You know, the Lord's view is comprehensive. He sees everything that He's made. He sees everyone. And He not only sees what's going on with us outwardly, 
He also knows what's going on in our minds. He knows what's in our hearts. The author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 4 verse 13, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The Lord knows what's going on. The Lord knows every thought. The Lord knows every desire of our hearts. Nothing is hidden from him. So the Lord is searching and he's looking and he's looking for something. Now as he searches, he knows that he's not going to find anything of value in, in everyone. As a matter of fact, he knows he's not going to see anything that's pleasing to him at all in those who do not know him. But he knows when he looks in our hearts, he will see something in us, something that is pleasing. And the reason is because we have received his grace. Our hearts have been washed. Our hearts have been transformed by the grace of God. We're no longer what we were before. But we do need to understand that what the Lord is looking for here is something that is a bit more than just the presence of his grace in our lives. What the Lord is looking for, I believe, essentially is this, what that grace has actually produced in our hearts, what we have done with the treasure that the Lord has entrusted to us, what we have done with that grace, with that help of the Holy Spirit. Now, we know that the new birth that Jesus talks about to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 is that work of the Holy Spirit that makes us alive. And we understand that that's something that God does. That's not something we can do. When Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again, uh, that's what we call passive. That's something that must be done to you. That's not something you do. You must be born again. And that birth can only come by the Holy Spirit. We really don't have anything to do with that. That's something that the Lord does sovereignly. But the Lord knows that once he has given us this new birth that there are things that we can now do that we never would have been able to do when we were still dead. So essentially, our father, in, in this sense, he's, he's kind of like, a, let's say, a father who has um, a large amount of money and he gives this money to, to each of his children. And then he steps back to see what it is they're going to do with what it is he has given them, how they will invest it, how they will use it, what it is they're going to make with it. The Lord has given to each of us a, a portion of His Holy Spirit. He has given to us this grace. He's given to us this new desire. And He wants to see how well we have used this gift. Now, how can we measure how well we have done with the gift that He has given to us? Well, we can measure it by what it is he says he's looking for in this particular passage. The prophet tells us that what he is looking for is, is really those whose hearts belong completely to him. Okay, he wants to see how that grace has worked and he wants to see it envelop us and consume us essentially. Now, when the Lord gave us his Holy Spirit, when he gave us his grace, he did free our hearts from sin. He freed our hearts from the world. He freed us from the bondage of the devil. He did that by turning our hearts toward him. He gave us an opposing desire. And this is what broke the power of sin in our lives so that we were no longer the slaves of sin. He gave us a love for him and a love for his kingdom. And because of that, we will never be what we were before. We know that we may fall. We may give in to our old desires, we may fall often, but we will never again be completely under the power of our sin because the Lord has set us free. But we also know that how much we are controlled by these two desires which we now have in our lives will be different for each one of us and that that has very much to do with how we use the gift that the Lord has given to us, what it is we do with His grace. Whether we use that grace to gain more grace. You know, we talk about the means of grace, right? That's the way we get more of the help of the Holy Spirit. It becomes stronger in our hearts. 
when we yield to this new desire that the Lord has put in our hearts for the things of the Lord, and yielding to this desire, we begin to spend more time with Him. We try to get to know Him better by reading His Word and studying it, by taking His Word and applying it to our lives, by worshiping Him with our whole lives, by becoming more like Jesus. Now, the more we do these things, the stronger that love is going to grow in our hearts for Him. But then the question comes, how do we measure that love? How do we know how strong that love actually is in our hearts? Well, we know the Bible has given to us really several different ways by which we can measure it. One of the ways is, is by what we sense of, of the strength of the affection that is in our hearts for the Lord, how we feel about Him. I know the term feel is, is a term that we need to be careful with, but we should feel love and affection for Him. Uh, we can measure that by how much we want to give ourselves to Him, how much we want to worship Him, how much when we are worshiping Him, our hearts soar uh, and, and, and really go out to Him as we sing and as we pray, uh, how our hearts respond when we hear His Word. Remember when the disciples were walking with Jesus on the road to Emmaus and Jesus was opening the scriptures and was teaching them the word of God and how their hearts were burning within them. He had given to them a great love and desire by his Holy Spirit. The Spirit was working in their hearts and they were soaking it up and loving it and amazed and, and lost in wonder. Well, that's one way in which we measure our love for the Lord. How do our hearts respond when we hear the word of the Lord? Do they burn within us or do they remain somewhat indifferent or, or cold? Uh, we can measure it also by how much we obey the Lord. Remember Jesus said in John 14 verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. To the degree that we keep the commandments, to that degree we love the Lord. Um, but we can also measure it by the strength of our faith by how much we trust the Lord. And that's essentially what the Lord was referring to when he sent his prophet to Asa. Remember, Asa and the southern kingdom were being threatened by Baasha's blockade. But instead of trusting the Lord and receiving his help, as he had earlier when he was confronted by this vast army of a million men, he trusted man. Remember, he trusted himself, his own ability to broker a deal with Ben-Hadad, and he trusted Ben-Hadad that he would be his ally and not an enemy, but he should have trusted the Lord. And really, that's what the Lord wants us to do. That is an expression of our love towards him. That is what honors him. That is what the Lord is worthy of. Now, we do need to understand that we already trust the Lord if we belong to Jesus. You know, along with that grace that he gives to us comes a measure of trust. Saving faith is more than just simply believing facts about the Lord Jesus. It's more than praying a prayer. It is a complete reliance upon him, a trust in what he has done and what he has done alone in his perfect life, in his death on the cross, in his really offering to us uh, to be a savior, his promise to save us. It doesn't have to do with what we've done. It is a complete reliance upon the Lord Jesus Christ to make us acceptable to God. That's what saving faith is, and saving faith is essentially trusting in that particular promise the Lord has given to us. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. And that's what the love that the Spirit of God uh, has really done in our hearts, the love He has put in our hearts, that's what it moves us to do, to trust in the Lord Jesus. But let's not forget that our trust needs to go beyond this. It needs to go beyond simply trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ to be justified before God. That trust needs to grow. The Lord wants us to learn to trust Him completely, to see him as trustworthy, which means that he is worthy of our trust in everything, not just for our justification, but for everything that we need. Our Lord teaches us to trust in him for our daily bread, 
The Lord wants us to trust in him for our health. He wants us to trust him for protection against our enemies, which is where Asa failed. He wants us to trust in him for our growth in grace. He wants us to trust in him for the salvation of our children. He wants us to trust in him for their well-being as they grow up and they, they go out on their own and they begin their own families. He wants us to trust in him for the salvation of our loved ones and our friends and our neighbors. He wants us to trust in him for the well-being of his church and the well-being of this nation. Essentially, he wants us to trust in him for absolutely everything. That's what the Lord is looking for. Now, remember that, too, that this level of trust that we're talking about is, is much greater than the kind of trust that we would have in a Christian brother or sister or friend to do certain things for us. This level of trust is actually an act of worship. Whatever we implicitly trust, whatever we put our whole hope in in this way, whatever we ultimately look to for our well-being is really the one we are looking to as our God. Now, if our trust is in man, we are elevating man above God. And we are giving him, or whatever it may be, maybe money, whatever it is, uh, whatever we're putting our trust and our hope in, we are elevating that above God and giving that person or that thing the honor that we should be giving to God alone. You know, sometimes we, uh, oftentimes we're tempted, especially in this society, to put our whole hope of our well-being in our finances, in, in, in our money, and to say that this is my hope, this is my, my security, this is why I believe things will be well with me. And yet the Lord tells us in his word that riches are like an eagle, that t you know, they, they take wing, they fly away. Uh, Jesus says we shouldn't lay up our treasures on earth because thieves can steal these things from us. And we know that uh, even a nation that's seemingly as secure as this one could really fold. And if that happened, I mean, there was the stock market crash. People lost everything. And we know there have been recessions as well. Uh, we can't put our trust in money. We need to put our trust in the Lord and in him alone. So the Lord wants our heart to be completely his. He wants us to love him the most and he wants us to show our love to him by trusting him the most for all these things. Trusting him, the, the word implicitly means that you know, we trust him for everything. We trust what he says. We trust what he's doing. We, we rely on him. We, we are secure in his love and we know that it's for our good. That's, that's what the Lord desires of us. Now lastly, we need to ask the question, what difference does it make? Whether we trust in him or, or don't trust in him. Well, it makes, as you know, all the difference in the world. Because why does the prophet say that the Lord is looking for those whose hearts are completely his? Well, it's that he might strongly support them. Now, Asa trusted the Lord when it came to the Ethiopians, when they came against him with an army of a million. It looked like there was no hope, and Asa realized that. He said, Lord, our trust, our reliance is entirely upon you and not upon man. What can we do? We're helpless. So we look to you, and when he looked to the Lord, the Lord answered that prayer, and he saved him. And he saved all of Judah. And he even took the wealth of the Ethiopians and gave it to him. But he didn't trust him when he was faced with Baasha's threat, which was essentially nothing compared to the million men that came out against him earlier. Maybe it's because... He thought he could handle this one, and the other one was clearly more than he could handle. But he looked to Ben-Hadad instead of looking to the Lord, and it cost him great wealth. Uh, Ben-Hadad and his army escaped his hand, and that army became a thorn, in, a thorn in his side. So, essentially, the Lord, it's going to cost us if we don't trust in him. But if we do trust in him, he will support us. He will strongly support us. He will help us. I mean, just look at examples in the Bible. Think about, you know, the, the, the place in the Bible you would go to if you wanted to learn a little bit more about faith. Where would you go? You could go to the book of Hebrews, and you could look at Hebrews chapter 11, and you can see how faith made a difference in the lives 
of, of those who had it and really trusted in the Lord. There were those who made tremendous sacrifices. Remember, Moses gave up the wealth of Egypt in order that he might suffer with the people of God because he believed God's promise. Remember, Abraham left his, uh, his family. He left his country and went to the country that the Lord was going to give him because he was looking for the promise that God had made. Uh, we see that Joshua, he was able to, as he comes into the promised land, he was able to fight against a city that looked impregnable. The walls of Jericho were were huge and could not have been humanly broken down, but because he trusted the Lord, he was able to see those walls fall and defeat all the armies of Canaan. We see the same thing with Gideon when he came against the Midianites. Samson when he fought against the Philistines and of course the, you know, the classic example, David, a small young shepherd boy going against this seasoned warrior who was a giant. He was able to defeat Goliath. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to worship the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up and were willing to face the fiery furnace, and they did, and they survived because they trusted the Lord. As we know, Daniel defied the king's order not to pray to anyone but the king, and he continued to pray to the Lord even though he knew that to do so would be risking being thrown into the lion's den, and he was willing to do that. And he went into the lion's den and spent the entire night there and survived because he trusted the Lord. Where did Luther find the courage to defy the church of his day and to preach the gospel at the risk of his life? You know, why were Whitfield and the Wesleys and Edwards and Spurgeon and many others able to do such great things for the Lord's kingdom and his glory? Why did the Lord provide, and this, again, the example of George Mueller is tremendous, but why, why did the Lord provide every day without fail everything that George Mueller needed, not only to supply the workers, but the thousands of orphans that he was taking care of? And how was he able to pray and to see the fog that basically kept, had locked their ship that he was on in one place? How was he able to pray and see that fog lifted instantly and to move on and to make his appointment? but it was because he trusted in the Lord. You know, the Lord tells us that he is looking for those who trust him, that he might strongly support them. Uh, we were reminded this morning in our meditation that without faith, without this trust, we really can't expect to receive anything from the Lord. You know, Jesus already told us in, in our meditation this evening that we need to make sure that when we ask for these things, we must not doubt, but we must believe that what we are saying is going to happen. And if we do, it will be granted to us. And all things we ask in prayer, believing that we have received them, they will be granted to us. We need to have faith. Jesus tells us that if we have faith, even the size of a mustard seed, we can move mountains. Now again, let me just encourage each of us to take a look back over our lives to see the faithfulness of the Lord. We've been in difficult situations before and we've sought the Lord for his mercies and the Lord was merciful to us. He did provide for us over and over again. We need to learn to trust in the Lord. Now let me just simply close with, with a quote from the, the book of Jeremiah. And this is essentially what the Lord said to Judah through Jeremiah. And this isn't the same time frame as Asa. The book of Jeremiah is dealing with the time just before the captivity. So this is toward the end of Judah's time in, in the land and so forth. But it reminds us of how important it is that we put our trust in the Lord. So let me close with these words. We read in Jeremiah 17, verses 5 and 8. Thus says the Lord... Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. For he will be like a bush in the desert and will not see when prosperity comes, but will live in a stony, in stony waste in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabitant. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its root by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green 
And it will not be anxious in a year of drought, nor cease to yield fruit. The Lord is looking for those whose heart is completely His. And He's given us the ability to do that through His Holy Spirit. But there is something that we need to do. We need to learn to put our trust in Him. And if we do, we won't be disappointed. Well, may the Lord bless His word to our hearing. Let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we, and ask the Lord to apply this to us.